Mycenaean Greece represents the final stage of the Bronze Age in ancient Greece, spanning from approximately 1600 to 1100 BC. It's named after the archaeological site of Mycenae, one of the major centers of Greek civilization during this period. The Mycenaeans are renowned for their advanced engineering, sophisticated palatial architecture, and the development of Linear B script, which was an early form of Greek recorded on clay tablets. Their society was a warrior aristocracy, and they made significant achievements in art, as evidenced by the ritually decorated pottery, frescoes, and gold work they left behind. And of course, we can't forget about their epics and mythology, particularly tales involving the Trojan War, which were immortalized by later Greek poets like Homer. And if you want to learn about them, you're certainly in the right place. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're coming back, then it's good to have you again. And if you're new here, it's good to meet you. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in description. And if you want to tell YouTube to push my video out to a broader audience, clicking the like button will nudge them in the right direction. Now, without further ado, please make yourself relaxed, and we can begin our history of Mycenaean Greece. The origins of the Mycenaeans are still a subject of various scholarly theories and debates. One theory suggests that the Mycenaean civilization was influenced by archaic Indo-Europeans that came down from the Eurasian steppe. But this connection is somewhat tenuous due to minimal material and cultural ties between the Aegean and northern steppe populations during the Bronze Age. Another theory suggests that Indo-European migrants may have entered Greece around 3000 BC, potentially into an underpopulated area, with other scholars proposing earlier or later dates tied to agricultural spread, or even chariot technology advancements. Genetic studies in our modern era reveal that while Mycenaeans and Minoans were genetically similar, Mycenaeans had additional ancestry from Eastern European and Siberian hunter-gatherers, possibly via the Eurasian steppe, but also there's a chance they could have came down from Armenia. This genetic input seems to distinguish them from the Minoans, but it doesn't conclusively resolve the questions about their specific origins. Well, archaeologically, Mycenaean civilization is generally understood to have begun around 1750 BC, evolving from the early and middle Bronze Age cultures of mainland Greece with substantial influence from Minoan Crete. By around 1700 and 1675 BC, there was a significant population increase, and the emergence of popular centers in southern Greece, characterized by elite warrior societies and early forms of Megaron buildings. Defensive structures and advanced burial practices, including shaft graves, rich with various luxury items of all sorts, became prevalent around this time. Now these shaft graves in particular, especially noted at Mycenae's grave circles A and B at the site, signify the rise of a rather wealthy and Greek-speaking royal dynasty that 
made the use of leveraging the business of long-distance trade. And it seems that they did quite well for themselves. In fact, gold-adorned burials were rather typical for the elite, with men often buried in golden masks along with golden armor, and women in gold crowns and ornamented clothing. Now, Mycenaean interaction with external regions, including the Cyclades, Crete, and even the broader Mediterranean and Near East, seems to have been very extensive. Mycenaean artifacts and pottery reached places as far away as Egypt, Asia Minor, and Cyprus, indicating a robust trade network. Art and cultural elements during this period show very clear Minoan influence, yet retain distinctive Hellenic traits, and of course some recognizable Western Asian features. Now in terms of architecture and art, Mycenaean works were simpler, yet more monumental than their Minoan counterparts, suggesting a blend of local and also foreign artistic traditions. Over time, though, Mycenaean civilization seems to have grown in sophistication, and it eventually surpassed the Minoan achievements. Of course, I've done a full video on the Minoans, if you're interested in that. May help you understand this one a little bit better. Now, the transition from the Shaft Grave period marked the adoption of Tholos tombs, kind of grand circular burial structures with vaulted roofs, showing an evolution in elite burial customs, and continuing the trend of increasing social complexity and architectural sophistication. By the 15th century BC, Mycenaeans had expanded their influence across the Aegean and into western Anatolia, establishing dominance over the region and marking the beginning of the Mycenaean coin era, a period of widespread cultural uniformity across mainland Greece and the Aegean islands. This era emerged after the Mycenaeans took control of the Minoan palace at Knossos, that was around 1450 BC. Then they went on to blend Minoan culture with their own to form a kind of hybrid civilization. The Mycenaeans utilized the collapse of Minoan power to extend their trade networks extensively. By the early 14th century BC, they reached as far as Cyprus, the Near East, Italy and Spain, exploiting new commercial opportunities. This period also saw the introduction of the Linear B script at Knossos, which was an adaptation of Minoan Linear A, spreading across Mycenaean palatial centers and providing crucial data on their administrative systems. Though the records are a little bit too fragmented to fully reconstruct the politics of Bronze Age Greece, so we can only do what we can and fill in the gaps with the rest. Now, on to Miletus in Asia Minor, where archaeological findings suggest a Mycenaean settlement from around 1450 replacing either Minoan installations, earlier Minoan installations rather. Miletus evolved into a significant Mycenaean hub until around the 12th century BC, a fact that is corroborated by records from the Hittites describing Miletos or Milawater in Hittite as a vital Mycenaean base in Asia Minor. Mycenaean influence also extended to nearby sites like Iasus and Ephesus. 
On the mainland, new palace complexes began to emerge around this time, signaling a shift towards more organized and monumental architectural projects. Initial palace structures included Megaron-type buildings, like the Menelaon in Sparta. From around 1400 BC, true palatial complexes with Cyclopean masonry began to appear, as seen in Mycenae and Tyrins. Additional palaces were constructed in locations such as Medea, Athens, Pylos, Eleusis, Thebes or Kamenos, and even as far north as Ialcos in Thessaly, the northernmost Mycenaean center. The palace at Knossos underwent significant renovations during this period, including the construction of a new throne room to suit the Mycenaean administrative needs. These palaces functioned within a highly structured bureaucratic system, where administrative duties were categorized and specialized. At the apex of this hierarchy was the king, which they called a wanax, who held complete authority as the chief landlord, spiritual leader, military commander, entrepreneur, and trader. His rule was supported by a network of high officials, illustrating a sophisticated and centralized governance system that facilitated Mycenaean expansion and cultural dominance during this era. The involvement of Ahiawa, identified by scholars as Mycenaean Greece, in the political and military affairs of Western Anatolia during the Late Bronze Age is well documented in Hittite texts. These texts, dating from around 1400 to 1220 BC, portray the kings of Ahiawa, the Hittite word for Mycenaean Greeks, as significant players capable of engaging diplomatically and militarily with the Hittite Empire. The exact geographic extent of the Ahiawa is not clear from the texts, at least the ones that we have now, but it likely included parts of mainland Greece and probably the Aegean Islands. Around 1400 BC, Hittite records describe the activities of Atarsia, an Ahiawan leader who might be connected to the legendary Greek figure Atreus. Atarsia led military campaigns against Hittite vassals in western Anatolia, notably attacking the region ruled by Maduata. This period marked the beginning of Ahiawa's influence in Anatolia, often exerted by fomenting anti-Hittite rebellions among the Hittite vassals. Now by 1315, Ahiawa supported a major rebellion in Arzawa, which was a pretty significant Hittite vassal state. Now this shows its continued involvement in regional politics beyond its own borders, aimed specifically at undermining Hittite authority. Archaeological findings corroborate the textual evidence of Ahiawan control over several Aegean islands during this time. Now, during the reign of the Hittite king Hattusili III, that was from 1267 to 1237, the Ahiawan ruler was acknowledged as Great King reflecting a status on par with the most powerful monarchs of the era, such as those of Egypt, Babylonia, and Assyria. Indeed, the same prefix is used for those other rulers in the Hittite materials. This recognition highlights the heightened political and military influence of the Ahiawa. At that time, 
Piyama Radu, an anti-Hittite agitator, received support from the Mycenaean Greeks, causing significant disturbances that extended to Willusa, which is possibly ancient Troy, it's one of the names that we have in Hittite records for it, and resulted in the seizure of the island of Lesbos. Now this chaotic period, characterized by recurring conflicts and politics, might have laid the historical groundwork for the legendary accounts of the Trojan War. The Hittite texts also mention a figure named Tawagalawa, who is suggested to be the brother of the Ahiyawan king, and may correspond to the Homeric character of Eteocles. Perhaps. Now, back to our Greek terminologies now. Around 1250 BC, several key centers in mainland Greece, including Thebes and Mycenae, experienced a wave of destructive attacks whose causes remain somewhat unclear, at least from the archaeological record. Thebes, a major city in Boeotia, was completely destroyed, either in this year of 1250 BC or quite soon after. Orchomenos, another significant Boeotian site, though not completely destroyed, was abandoned around about this same time. Gla, known for its monumental structures, saw deliberate targeting and destruction of specific areas, such as the gates and a major building known as the Melathron. In response to these threats, several Mycenaean cities undertook extensive fortification efforts. For example, Tyrins, Medea, and Athens bolstered their defences by constructing massive cyclopean walls, a style characterised by the use of enormous limestone boulders fitted together without the use of mortar. Mycenae itself nearly doubled the fortified area of its citadel, adding significant features such as the Lion Gate, which became the main entrance to the Acropolis. Well, despite all of the destruction, there was a brief resurgence of Mycenaean culture, suggesting a period of recovery and revival. Mycenaean Greece remained active in internal politics, particularly evident in Hittite records from around 1220, which mentions the involvement of the Ahiawa king in an uprising against the Hittite authority in western Anatolia. Additionally, Hittite texts from the same period advise Ahiawan ships to steer clear of Assyrian-controlled ports, indicating a trade embargo against Assyria. However, the broader picture during the second half of the 13th century shows a general decline in trade across the eastern Mediterranean, likely due to the increasingly unstable political climate for pretty much everybody. By around 1190, a second wave of destruction swept through Mycenae, effectively ending its status as a major power. This catastrophic event left Mycenae significantly diminished, marked by subsequent reoccupations, albeit on a much smaller scale. In contrast to previous beliefs that natural disasters such as earthquakes might have caused these destructions, recent archaeological evidence, including the discovery of numerous arrowheads in the debris at Medea, suggests a violent human assault as the cause. The palace of Pylos met a similar fate around 1180. The Linear B texts found here 
preserved amidst the destruction, record urgent defensive preparations in response to an immediate threat. Although they do not specify who the attackers are. This period saw general widespread turmoil across Mycenaean Greece, with notable declines in population, particularly in regions like Boeotia, Argolis, and Messenia. Many Mycenaeans fled to Cyprus and the Levantine coast, seeking refuge from all the instability. Despite the widespread destruction, there were some areas, especially those on the periphery of the Mycenaean sphere, such as the Ionian Islands, northwestern Peloponnese, parts of Attica, and a few of the Aegean Islands, not only endured, but even thrived during these times. Athens, notably, seemed to escape the destruction that befell many other centers, suggesting a possible shift towards decentralized coastal and maritime networks that were less vulnerable to the conflicts and disruptions impacting mainland palatial centers. This evidence from the cemetery at Parati in Attica, lasting through the 12th century BC, shows a continuity of occupation and a blend of local and imported goods across the Mediterranean. This points to ongoing trade and cultural exchanges even after the collapse of the palatial systems. Similarly, the late Helladic Three Sea Cemetery at Drivlia, near Porto Rafti, underscores Attica's continued participation in broader trade networks. Well, in the aftermath of all of this, Mycenae's influence waned considerably, and the regional focus shifted to Tiryns. During the late Helladic III period, from around 1200 to 1050, Tiryns expanded and became the dominant center in the Argolid region, reflecting a realignment of power and economic activity within the region as communities adapted to the new post-palatial realities. This era marked a significant transformation in Mycenaean civilization, with the emergence of smaller and more dispersed settlements that did nonetheless maintain some degree of cultural continuity from the palatial period. The collapse of the Mycenaean palace system marking the end of Mycenaean Greece, remains one of the most debated mysteries in the history of the ancient world. There are several competing theories that attempt to explain this decline, each of them supported by varying degrees of archaeological and textual evidence. So let's have a look. We'll go through a few of the theories and explain them briefly. And after that we'll get on to a little bit more of the cultural and societal aspects of Mycenaean Greece. Well, the first and probably the most popular theory is the one of population movement and invasion. First being the Dorian invasion. This long-held theory rooted in ancient Greek tradition suggests that the Dorians, an ethic, ethnically, ethically, ethnically distinct group, speaking a variant of the Greek language, that being Doric, migrated southward over several years, and this migration caused widespread destruction, and eventually they settled in the regions that were formerly held by the Mycenaeans. The theory points to changes in burial practices and pottery styles as evidence of this new population's influence. And next, of course, we can't go past the Late Bronze Age without mentioning the mysterious Sea Peoples. Coinciding with the Mycenaean Collapse is the activity of the Sea Peoples, a confederation of naval traders who attacked parts of Anatolia, 
the Levant and Egypt, sometime around 1175 BC, thereabouts. Some scholars propose that one of these groups, the Ekwesh, were linked to the Ahiawa mentioned in the Hittite records, possibly identifying them with the Mycenaeans. Well, either way, the havoc wreaked by these groups in the eastern Mediterranean could have contributed to, or at least coincided with, the fall of Mycenaean Greece. Either way, it was overall a bad time for everybody. It certainly would have had its effect. Uh, then we have theories of internal conflict and social strife, which are also quite popular theories. First being civil unrest. Uh, this perspective argues that internal strife driven by the rigid and hierarchical structure of the Mycenaean society led to uh, internecine warfare and rebellion against the ruling Wanax. Remember, that is the Mycenaean word for king. This scenario suggests a collapse from within, rather than due to external forces, a kind of political implosion. Next is a theory of economic and systemic breakdown. Economic decline and the breakdown of redistributive palace economies, which could no longer sustain the demands of its bureaucracy and military, may have also played a role in the collapse, but we need a little bit more uh, elaboration on that. Hopefully we'll be able to find some more tablets and texts that will uh, corroborate that theory. Next, of course, is natural disasters and environmental factors. Some researchers have suggested that prolonged droughts or climate changes may have undermined agricultural productivity, leading to economic and social stresses that the palatial system simply did not have the power to withstand. Of course, given the geological activity in the area, significant earthquakes could have damaged critical infrastructure, leading to economic difficulties and making the palaces vulnerable to invasion or simply internal collapse. Lastly, we have some theories regarding demographic and societal changes. Some theories suggest that overpopulation led to migration and societal shifts, a pattern observed in other ancient civilizations like the Minoans, the Harapans, and even later in the Western Roman Empire. The period following the Mycenaean collapse, roughly from around 1100 to 800 BC, is often referred to as the Greek Dark Ages. During this time, Greece saw a significant reduction in population and a loss of writing, which resulted in fewer and, frankly, less impressive material culture remains compared to the palatial period. The era was marked by simpler, more isolated communities that gradually developed into the classical city-states of our main conception of ancient Greece. Despite the variety of proposed explanations, there really isn't a single theory that comprehensively accounts for the decline of the Mycenaean civilization, and the topic continues and will continue for quite a while to be a fertile ground for research and debate among scholars. Now, let's get on to a little bit of the economic information about the Mycenaeans, because they were quite formidable in that domain. The economy was complex and highly organized. It reveals a sophisticated society that managed resources and labor efficiently across various sectors. The centralized administration, 
as evident from preserved Linear B tablets, played a critical role in monitoring and distributing resources, demonstrating advanced bureaucratic capabilities, especially for the time. Now the Linear B tablets from Gnosis indicate extensive sheep farming, with detailed records of sheep numbers and the production of wool. It suggests a structured approach to livestock management and secondary product processing, which were critical economic activities. Records from Pelos reveal a specialized workforce, where laborers were categorized and assigned specific tasks, particularly in textile production. While the palaces exerted direct control over the key industries like perfumed oil and bronze production, other sectors such as ceramics were less tightly controlled, indicating a selective approach to economic management. This strategy allowed for flexibility and efficiency in resource allocation. The existence of transactions between different palatial centers hints at a cooperative economic network further emphasized the complexity of Mycenaean economic structures. Significant engineering projects such as the drainage of the Copias Basin and the construction of dams were undertaken to enhance agricultural productivity and manage water resources effectively. These projects likely required the combined efforts of multiple palatial centers, showing the Mycenaeans' ability to organize large-scale infrastructure projects. The construction of harbors, like the harbor of Pylos, capable of accommodating large Bronze Age vessels, and extensive workshop complexes for manufacturing goods for export and shipbuilding give us another example of the advanced economic activities and infrastructure capabilities of the Mycenaeans. The most famous project of the Mycenaean era was the network of roads in the Peloponnese, which facilitated the speedy develop deployment rather of troops and connected the various palatial centers. Trade was a cornerstone of Mycenaean Greece's economy, stretching across the Mediterranean and beyond. Mycenaean palaces managed imports of essential raw materials like metals, ivory and glass, and exported processed commodities such as oil, perfume, wine, wool, and a great deal of finely crafted pottery. This trade was not exclusively controlled by palace authorities. Independent merchants also played a significant role in these international exchanges. Archaeological evidence, including artifacts, inscriptions, and wall paintings found across the Middle East, indicate robust commercial and cultural interactions between the Mycenaeans and various Bronze Age civilizations, such as the Kassites, Mitanni, Canaanites, Assyrians, and of course, the Egyptians. The discovery of the 14th century Uluburun shipwreck off the coast of southern Anatolia highlights these extensive trade networks, which provided the Mycenaeans with the materials necessary for bronze production and other goods. Cyprus was a critical intermediary in Mycenaean trade. It acted as a hub for exchanges between Greece and the Middle East, evidenced by the significant quantities of Mycenaean goods that we've found on the island. While interactions with the Hittite lands in central Anatolia were a little more limited, trade connections with Troy, and further expansions into the Bosphorus and the Black Sea coast were all firmly established, 
with Mycenaean swords even reaching Georgia. The Mycenaeans also engaged extensively with regions in the Italian peninsula and the western Mediterranean. Their pottery and other products found significant markets in southern Italy, Sicily, and the Aeolian Islands, even as far as Sardinia and southern Spain. More sporadic finds of Mycenaean artifacts have been discovered in Central Europe, including a remarkable amber object bearing Linear B inscriptions found in Bavaria, Germany. Additionally, Mycenaean double bronze axes and other items from the 13th century BC have surfaced as far away as Ireland, and even in regions of England, such as Wessex and Cornwall. Evidence of opium use in Mycenaean culture has also been identified, with traces of it found in ceramic vases from this period. The trade in opium poppies, evident in the eastern Mediterranean from as early as 1650 BC, points to an early version of a narcotics trade. Mycenaean culture, as evidenced through their wall paintings and archaeological findings, shows a nuanced social structure regarding gender roles and the status of women. Women in Mycenae were typically portrayed in art, wearing long dresses and adorned with jewellery such as beads, made from materials like carnelian and lapis lazuli. These beads, significant in Mycenaean society, were worn on bracelets, necklaces and cloak buttons, and were often included in burial rites. In contrast to later Greek periods where female seclusion was more common, we don't have any evidence suggesting that Mycenaean women were secluded from men, and it appears that men and women interacted regularly in both domestic and economic settings. While men typically engaged in warfare and hunting, the involvement of women in hunting is somewhat debatable, with no firm evidence supporting their participation in warfare either. Mycenaean society was, as it seems to be, quite patriarchal. But rationing records indicate an equitable distribution of food, with women receiving the same rations as men. This suggests a certain level of equality in basic economic provisions. Women's economic roles, however, were largely defined by their social status and proximity to palatial centers. Linear B tablets mention work groups of female laborers often working alongside their children and closely managed by palace scribes. These women, likely low-ranking laborers, performed tasks such as textile production and were possibly considered slaves. Although this is a point of contention, we don't really know for sure. Women could, however, attain positions of power and influence through religious roles. Titles such as priestess not only conferred social prestige, but also economic benefits, such as land holdings. The evidence indicates that while ordinary women may not have had the opportunity to own land or achieve economic independence, those who ascended to certain religious or skilled positions could exercise significant social authority. Elite women, though married to high-ranking officials and enjoying certain privileges, did not possess land or economic independence, on their own at least. Only through their husbands did they enjoy such things. Now, the Palace of Knossos 
compared to other Mycenaean centers like Pylos, may have offered a more egalitarian setting for women. Although this suggestion remains speculative with little concrete evidence to support a markedly different treatment of women there compared to other Mycenaean sites. During the Mycenaean period, burial practices varied, but inhumation was the predominant method, involving the burial of the body in the earth covered by dirt and stones. The earliest Mycenaean burials were primarily in individual graves, either simple pits or stone-lined cysts, with offerings typically limited to pottery and occasional items of jewelry, but these were rare. Over time, however, groups of these graves, particularly those containing elite members of the community, were sometimes covered by a tumulus or mound, a practice with ancient origins possibly reflecting earlier traditions like those of the Kurgan culture. However, Scholars now largely view Mycenaean burial customs as indigenous developments within mainland Greece, particularly exemplified by the native rulers interred in the shaft graves at Mycenae. These shaft graves, located within grave circles A and B at the Mycenae site, represent a distinct form of elite burial grouping from the same period. They are notable for the rich grave goods found alongside the deceased, including full sets of weapons, ornate staffs, and valuable gold and silver vessels, indicating the high social status of those buried there. Alongside these more elaborate burials, simpler pit and cyst graves continued to be used throughout the Mycenaean period for individual burials. In the late Helladic period, communal tombs begin to appear, characterized by their rectangular shape. The use of different burial forms has led to speculation about social stratification, with earlier theories suggesting that monumental Tholos tombs were reserved solely for elite rulers. Individual tombs for the leisure class and communal tombs for the general populace as well, all coming under these Tholos banner. However, the direct correlation between the tomb type and social hierarchy remains a little bit of a mystery. Perhaps we'll find out when we find the next tombs. Cremation also became increasingly common but towards the end of the Mycenaean era, indicating a shift in burial practices. The introduction of the Tholos tomb in the early 15th century marked a new phase in elite burials, characterized by their impressive and imposing circular structures, with high vaulted roofs, such as the treasury of Atreus at Mycenae, this period saw the construction of several such tombs, particularly in the region of Mycenae, where a cluster of nine Tholos tombs includes six from a single period, that period being the late Helladic IIa, around 1400 to 1300 BC. The scale and grandeur of these royal tombs, especially those at Mycenae, suggest they were intended for the royal family and possibly reflect competition among different dynasties or factions within the Mycenaean society, using conspicuous burials as a means of asserting status and power. In the 8th century BC, Greece began to emerge from the so-called Greek Dark Ages, a period marked by the flourishing of myths and legends, epitomized by the Trojan epic cycle. The classical Greeks held the Mycenaean period in high regard, 
viewing it as an error of heroes, divine proximity, and material prosperity. The Homeric epics in particular were revered as true historical accounts, a perspective that persisted until the 19th century, when scholars like German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann began to critically evaluate Homer's historicity. Schliemann's excavations at Mycenae in 1876 aimed to validate the historical settings of the Iliad, marking the first modern archaeological efforts in Greece to explore Mycenaean civilization. He was also the one who found the city of Troy as well. The legacy of the Mycenaeans was profound, influencing later Greek culture significantly. The gods and goddesses venerated during the Mycenaean era evolved into the Olympian pantheon that we're all pretty familiar with, revered in the later Greek antiquity. Furthermore, the Mycenaean language represents the earliest recorded form of Greek, contributing words to the modern English lexicon. I've probably said a few Greek words during this lecture today, and you haven't even noticed. The Mycenaeans were notable for their advanced engineering skills too, initiating ambitious projects such as fortifications, roads, bridges, and aqueducts, which were unparalleled in Europe until the Roman era. They introduced architectural innovations, like the relieving triangle, and were instrumental in disseminating arts and crafts, particularly those derived from the earlier Minoan influences. Well, all in all, their civilization was unique and markedly more sophisticated than other late Bronze Age cultures in Europe. Not all of them, but quite a few of them, earning them a place as a cornerstone in the history of our earliest peoples. Well, thank you very much for listening. Once again, I'd like to thank my top-tier Patreon subscribers, as being JC, Stark Factory, and Jeffrey. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to support the channel, well, go in the description and you know what to do. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pleasure, once again. And I will see you next time. Good night for now.